the Lord speaks most clearly, most often, through His Word. And I'm glad that we get to spend some time in that. Uh, we've been going through a series, just, just walking just through the book of Acts. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 18 here in just a minute. Uh, even making our way into to Acts 19, we've been making our way through. And so grateful for that in this time. But, but as we dig in, I was, I was thinking about uh, something from, from my childhood. I'm a little bit um, of a math nerd. And so in school, uh, I'm also, growing up, I was very much a smart aleck, and, and I wanted to argue about everything. And I remember the very first time uh, I was introduced to finding the area of a circle. Anybody know how to find the area of a circle? Yeah, pi radius squared. Uh, and I, I remember uh, my teacher at the time, she said, all right, I'm testing things. Uh, we're just going to use 3.14 for pi. Uh, but I found out that 3.14 is not actually pi. Right? 3.14 is just kind of the, the, the first three numbers. Uh, and so I said, man, that's just not accurate. It just didn't sit well with me as an argumentative kid. And so I decided I was going to remember pi as far as I could. 3.14159265398979. Uh, right? I was like, I'm going to remember 20 digits of pi, and I'm going to use that number on test. And so I'm, I'm going to like prove my, my teacher wrong. She's going to have you know, multiple choice, and, and I'm going to, to have uh, the most, the more accurate answer uh, on all the tests. And I remember that the first test came around, and, and I did just that. It took twice as long as I'm putting all these numbers into the calculator and, and doing this multiplication. And, and I turned it in, and I felt really proud of myself because I was you know, marking a, a number. It's like, hey, this is the, the more accurate number um, of, of pi. You know, this is the, the, the better answer. None of your answers really fit. And, uh, and she just made one, one comment on my sheet when she turned it back to me. She said, if you're going to uh, try to have the most accurate number, make sure you have the, the right first number. I did 4.14. <laughs> uh, and so even though I thought I knew so much and I knew all these things and I knew better and, and I had it all figured out, uh, I, I didn't, uh, I was completely wrong and not even close. And it was like in that moment, uh, I, I realized and something we're going to even look at today is that you can know a lot. You can even know the most of, of, of other people, yet you don't know what's most important, you can still be wrong. And that foundation just really informs a, a, a lot of, of our lives, and, and so that's what I want us to, to look at this morning, is what we're digging in to, to Acts, after, Acts chapter 18. Uh, uh, if you're not familiar with this, or you haven't been with us, we're kind of following some, the missionary journeys of Paul. Uh, we're even looking at this morning, he kind of finishes up uh, his second missionary journey, and it translates kind of right into his third missionary journey. Uh, and so we're going to be introduced to some characters and just see how they deal with uh, when things go wrong, when you get things wrong, because we all get things wrong. Uh, hopefully you're not prideful like me and, and, and are proud in your mistakes, but uh, let's, let's just look at the text and see what it has to say. In Acts chapter 18, starting at verse 22, it says, when he, this, is, this he here is Paul, it says, when he had landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and went down to Antioch. And after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all disciples. There's a lot that happens just in these couple of verses. That means Paul's kind of, he's ended his, his first missionary, or second missionary journey. Antioch, this, this church in Antioch, is his home base, his home church. So he went back home to see friends, family members, uh, he maybe even collected an offering. They, they said, hey, we want to support you on this next journey. He spent a little bit of time there. Uh, we don't know how long, and then he's immediately sent right back out. And he goes and he's strengthening these different churches. Verse 24. It says, now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, he came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, confident in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. And this was, was, was a huge moment. We're introduced to this guy named Apollos that, that we're going to learn that God used incredibly for the kingdom of God. And he had so many things right. So that he was very confident in the scriptures. He, he knew a lot. He was very eloquent. People wanted to, to listen to him. 
And yet there's just like one small little detail where, where he had just missed it. He didn't know uh, 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 as much about Jesus. He only knew the baptism of John. And, and, and man, that just really just struck me with, with us making sure that we realize that we all have a lot to learn. And we all have a lot to learn. If you've been walking with Jesus for, for one day or 50 years or still not yet, I mean, none of us have it all figured out. We all have a lot to learn. And why that's so important for, for us to, to recognize it and believe is because as soon as we stop thinking that we have anything to learn or, or any area to, to grow in, that's going to uh, cause us to, to, to be in opposition against growth. We're, we're going to learn in just a minute how, how that was actually dealt with. But, man, I can just think for, for so long, God, one of the things I love about Paul is the longer he went in ministry, the more things that he began to learn and know, the more he said, man, I don't know anything. One of my favorite things about Paul in the beginning of his ministry, he called himself the least of the apostles. Which kind of means he's like, hey, I'm the least of the best of the best. By the end of his ministry, the, the more he spent time knowing the depths of God, the more he spent time uh, then reflecting on the depths of himself, not only did he say he's the least of the apostles, he said, hey, I'm the chief of sinners. He said, I I've learned so much about God and his holiness and, and how much uh, set apart he is for me and how perfect and holy our God is. And, and, and in turn, that shows me how desperately in need I am of him. Because there's nothing I can do without him. And the more that we just explore the, the, the depths of God, the more that we just get to see uh, what we don't know, what we long to know. One of the things that I hear uh, people say often is, like, man, I can't wait to, to get to heaven, so then I'll get to, to know everything. I'll have kind of the answers to all my questions. And, and that's never promised in Scripture. Because we worship an infinite and holy God. And you can spend the rest of eternity, the rest of forever, and never fully know the depth of our God. And I don't know about you, but that blows my mind. That we worship a God that great, that mighty, that powerful. That that knowledge about him is inexhaustible. And the more that we do learn, the more that we realize we don't know. And that's the good news. What was interesting here is, that, and maybe you even, as we were reading through the text, it's like, man, it just doesn't seem like a huge deal what Apollos did now. Apollos just, just believed in uh, a little bit different things about baptism. Why is that such a big deal? And, and, and the reason that's important is Paul said he only believed or only taught that the baptism of John, referring to John the Baptist. A little bit of Bible history, John is kind of the pre-runner for Jesus. He's the guy that, that was telling everybody possible about this coming Messiah, this Jesus that, that was going to come. And so with John's baptism, the baptism was saying, um, hey, uh, you're getting baptized in preparation and pointing to a coming Messiah one day. One day we're going to have a Savior that's going to come and rescue us from, from our sin and all of our failures and all our mistakes. And so he wants you to get baptized to point forward to that. And that's what Apollos was, was still teaching. And, and why that's wrong is because, man, we have a Messiah that by this point has already come. Jesus has already came and lived a perfect life. And one day he took on all the mistakes you've ever made, all the mistakes I've ever made. He took them on himself because even though you deserve the penalty for all that, he said, I'm going to pay the debt that you owe because you can't ever afford it. Jesus paid that on himself. He, he paid the, the debt of our sin. And then he showed his power over sin in the grave by raising from the grave three days later. And so, so now we, we get uh, baptized to point back to that. 
But Paul was just saying, hey, we're pointing forward still to a future Messiah that hasn't come yet. And so that's, that's a big deal. Because we can disagree about a lot of things, but, but we've got to agree that, that Jesus alone is, is, is power for salvation for all those who believe. And so that's why it was so important that he got this right. But just real quick, since, since this was an issue of baptism, I want to just walk through just, just what we even believe as a church, or even some wrong teachings I've seen just address just, just kind of quickly of, of baptism. It's not something I planned on doing, but as we just preach through texts of the Bible, we just got to deal with what comes up, right? One of the, the big parts about baptism that I see get wrong and it, it breaks my heart, but this foundation that, hey, baptism does not, cannot, will not save you. I, I, I've been a part of churches before that have taught it's just wrongly that, that, man, if you want to spend eternity with God, have a relationship with Him, you have to be baptized. That is, it's, a, it's a requirement for salvation. And, and, and we don't see that taught anywhere in Scripture because uh, the reason that's so scary and the reason I even want to address it this morning is because we get in trouble anytime we try to add anything to Jesus. Because Jesus alone. It's power for salvation. It's, it's, it's through him, faith in him alone that we are saved. All right, all right. And baptism, nowhere in Scripture, is a prerequisite for that. It has nothing to, to, to do with, with you becoming in right relationship with God. That's foundation number one. However, with that being said, it's one of the first steps and acts of obedience that we can take. Right, well, there's nothing we can do to kind of earn God's favor, to earn salvation. There's nothing we can do to, to kind of solve all the bad things that we've done. We just have to trust Jesus. However, once we do begin a relationship with Jesus, uh, God calls us to, to pursuing a life like Jesus. And we're going to mess that up all the time. I know I do. Today, Right? But one of the first steps of obedience that, that a new believer can take is saying, man, I want to want to represent uh, or point to Jesus through the act of baptism. Again, there's nothing that, that specifically happens in the water, nothing special. It's just it's symbolic to the world, even to yourself, that, man, I've chosen to trust in Jesus and not myself. Because I tried to trust in myself for far too long, and it's got me in this mess chosen to trust in Jesus alone. The last thing I want to say about baptism is baptism isn't about you. It's like weird. It's like this moment I even invite people. When I got baptized, I came, I got this special shirt, or this video, all, all this stuff. But with baptism, it points to a washing world, the finished work of Jesus. It's not saying, hey, here's what, what I'm going to do now, and here's what's special about me. It shows the watching world, man, what Jesus did in me is so special. He died for me. That's what baptism represents. He died for me. He was put in the grave, and three days later, he rose again. Not based on me or anything that I've done, but everything on him. And it points to watching world, the finished work of Jesus. That's the beautiful picture of baptism. So that, that was some, some side notes, some, some bonus on, on what, what even Apollos was dealing with and, and where he just kind of got it wrong. He was still pointing to a future Messiah to come. And, and, and he's like, hey, we've we got to get that right. And so uh, did, now we get to find out if he kind of stayed in that wrong teaching or, or what happened next. Verse 26 says, he, this, he, as Apollos, began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This beautiful picture. You have this, this godly couple we were introduced to last week. That They saw this brother and said, hey, you're fervent. Uh, you're, you're living boldly, but let me just show you where you're out of step. Let me show you how pi actually starts with three and not four. Right? Or something that's even actually uh, more important than that. 
And then continue verse 27. It says, And when uh, he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed. For he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, shown by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. And now this is a pivotal moment in this man's life. Because he had something happen that none of us in the room like. Right, Apollos is like, man, I, I'm killing this thing. I'm speaking boldly. I, I, I got a crowd that said that he was eloquent. Like people like to listen to this guy. He's like, man, I got 100,000 uh, Twitter followers. He's like, man, I, I, I'm something. And it was in that that people graciously pulled him aside and said, hey, let me just show you something. But thankfully, one of the things that changed the, the, the trajectory of his entire life, he listened. It would have been so easy for him to, to tell this couple, saying, hey, you don't have the platform I have. You don't have the boldness I have. You don't have the ability to speak like I do. Maybe you, you, don't, even, uh, you don't even know the things that I know. He could have very easily responded with, with conflict in this situation. and said, he said, you know what, I'm going to listen. Because I, th I think he really got uh, this point that the correction speeds up transformation. Correction speeds up transformation. I don't know about you, but but my past life, my, my life apart from Jesus, I needed it desperately to be completely transformed. Not like a little bit, not, not just kind of redirect. I needed to be completely transformed, and, and I still need that. There's still aspects of me that, that I get so wrong continually that I need the transforming power of the gospel and we all need correction in our lives. But even more importantly than, than we need correction is we need to respond to it well. We need to respond to correction well. And I know this isn't easy. Nobody in the world likes to be told that they're wrong or that they've missed it or they don't have it figured out or anything of the sorts. But, but if we acknowledge the first point, we all kind of agreed when we said, hey, we don't have it all figured out. If we acknowledge that to be true, and that's why I started with that foundation, then, then we must also acknowledge that, that we're going to need correction at times. Even when it is messy, even when it's not told to us in the best way, thankfully, Aquila and Priscilla here uh, do it in a really good way. Sometimes it doesn't happen like that. But what if we looked at every single opportunity of, of correction and said, man, this is a way not only for, for me to learn and to grow and to get better, but a way and an opportunity for the gospel to further transform my life. And I want that for each and every one of us. This is one of the things that, that is just, just really important. Because we can even think that this issue with the pause is not a big deal. But small, insignificant issues left unaddressed can become catastrophic, catastrophic problems later. I've done a lot of counseling with men over the years. And I've never met a man that was taking steps of adultery that, that it just started there. Right, it started with second glances that he shouldn't have been taken. Visiting websites that he had no business on. Started with liking pictures on social media that he had no business liking. Right, and, and if it would have been small corrections in the beginning, it could have avoided catastrophic failure. I imagine every one of us could look at our lives that way as well. And if this problem, issue, or concern, if it would have been stopped at that point, it would have been awkward, it would have been frustrating if somebody would have corrected me or called me out. Man, 
man, it would have prevented so much heartache. So twofold of this, I pray that we would live like Aquila and Priscilla to be able to humbly and, and boldly tell people, hey, I love you, and because I love you, I need to show you where you're out of step with the gospel. It's not because I like telling people they're wrong. It's not because I, uh, I'm mad at you or upset at you because I want God's best for you in your life. I need to show you right step of the gospel. And I pray that we would all be like Apollos on the other side and receive it. And we receive it well and pursue Jesus even in the difficulty. Even in the ugly, even when we don't get it right and we mess it up. Because the reality is we have much to learn. And secondly, correction and speeds up that learning, that transformation process. And that's what's so incredible. We get to see all that, that, that God was able to accomplish through Apollos because he heeded that correction. Now, we continue in chapter uh, 19. Chapter 19, picking up in verse 1. It says, And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country and came to Ephesus. There he found some disciples. He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, we have not even heard of the Holy Spirit. Here's one of those moments that's saying, hey, uh, there, there's a lot of things that you probably got wrong, but, but if you don't have the, the foundation of the Spirit in the moment, it's even going to talk about baptism again. He says, then, then you're missing everything. So if you, you're not filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, you got nothing. It's like a car without an engine. Because a car without an engine actually makes life more difficult. Right? It'd be easier just to walk to get somewhere. <laughs> so you trying to live a life for God without the Holy Spirit is actually even more difficult than not trying to live for Him. Because you don't have the power to do the, what God's calling you to do. And the Spirit of God wants to, to not only work in you, but He wants to work through you to accomplish something so much bigger than yourself. And so Paul then, he teaches them, he teaches them the correct, uh, talk about baptism, but even more about the, the indwelling, filling of the, the Holy Spirit that, 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 that Jesus, even when He was here on earth, this is what He said about the Holy Spirit. He's telling His disciples, the guys that He's just spent the last three plus years with, He's come to the end of his ministry. He said, hey, I'm about to die. He said, but, but it's okay because when I leave, you're going to get something even better. Which is wild to think about. Right? They literally had Jesus in the flesh. They saw him turn a Lunchable into enough food to feed thousands of people. They saw this man turn water into wine, uh, uh, heal the blind, they saw him walk on. They saw all these things happen. They got to follow him around for three years. And then Jesus says something that blows my mind to this day. He says, hey, I'm going to give you something even better than me with you. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit to indwell in you. And why that's such good news is because that's true for us today as well. Praise the Lord. So he, he, Paul preaches this gospel. They get saved. They're filled with the Spirit and power. But here's what, what's so incredible. The, the last verse I want to really point us to in verse 10. It talks about Paul continuing to do ministry there. And this is kind of the summary uh, of, of all that has happened. Verse 10, it says, This continued for two years. We've been kind of following Paul's story, and it's like been really quick. It's taken us like, four weeks to go over all his missionary journeys, and it can be easy to think about, right, oh, that was just kind of quick, it's just, just quick little journeys, he popped in here and there, and uh, this was over in a few weeks. This lasted uh, over 10 years. His missionary journeys, his investment in people, and this is the, one of the conclusions that the verse 10 says, this continued for two years, so that 
all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord, both Jews and the Greeks. That's one of the most incredible verses ever in the scripture. That, that through obedience to the gospel, that the Holy Spirit empowered individuals to take the gospel to the entirety of the continent of Asia. That's incredible. And this is what it reminded me of. One of the last things I want to leave you with is that God's plan is bigger than you. God's plan is bigger than just you. I mean, can you ever think for one second that, that Paul thought that the gospel was going to make it to the entirety of Asia when he started on this journey? When he met Jesus for the first time on the road to Damascus 20 years earlier than this. That not just through him, but through the church and through the spread of the gospel, that he reached the entire continent of Asia. And one of the things, why I just think this, this is so important is, is because we're kind of twofold, we, we often, one, uh, we can think, can learn to think that we're bigger than God's plan. Like, man, I never thought that. Let me, let me explain. I, I've met with people that are just kind of agonized over decisions. Like, man, do, do I move here or there? Do I take this job or that job? And, and I just don't want to do the wrong thing. I don't want to mess up God's plan. And I don't want to throw everything off. I want to make sure I make the right change right plan and even get sick over just difficult decisions and I want you to know that hey God's plan is bigger than just you. God has a plan to to glorify himself uh, by redeeming the entire world and and whatever decision you make in a situation isn't going to throw off God in his plan. He's bigger than you. That's comforting. We can take comfort in that. The second aspect of that we can often lean on our own abilities and what we, what we think is possible in and of ourselves. I believe that God in heaven says, hey, I want to do something even bigger than that. Whatever that you think you're capable of, whatever that you hope to accomplish, uh, even Paul, this guy that was literally uh, persecuting the Christian church, he was the guy in Acts chapter 7 that was holding everybody's coats as they stoned and killed Stephen. God said, hey, hey, even you, I want to be a catalyst to, to see the gospel spread to every single person in Asia. God wants to do more in and through you than you could ever imagine. I believe what he's calling you to is not to aspire to that, but aspire to the first step of obedience. The next step of obedience, whatever that may be look like for your life. And he writes, he explains it this way. He says, God's plan extends beyond our individual lives and encompasses the redemption of all creation. We are called to be faithful stewards of this plan and work towards the restoration of all things. And it says that that good news is that God's plan is so much bigger than us. But yet, we get to be a part of it. We get to be a part of all that he's doing. And he says, hey, just, just be faithful in your next step, whatever that may be. That's my prayer for, for every one of us. That one, that, that we could just acknowledge this foundation that we all have much to learn. That we can heed, that we can live and, uh, in a way that, that, that we could allow correction to speed up transformation in our life and then acknowledge that God's plan is bigger than us. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to pray here in a moment and we're even going to sing another song here in just a moment. We just we just call this a time to, to respond. Right, maybe some of that, maybe you, you struggled with, like me at times, with pride and saying, man, I got it all figured out. Maybe this time you just need to ask the Lord, hey, Lord, would you show me where I don't have it figured out? Maybe would you give me an Aquila or Priscilla to, to point it out? Maybe somebody has said something to you recently that, that you, you know they're right, but you're still mad at them for even saying it. Would you say, Lord, would you help me to, to figure that out? 
Would you use that to work on and in and through me? Maybe you want to just pray that this last prayer is, Lord, would you just pray me? Uh, would you just use me to do something bigger than, than me to, to help in accomplishing your mission? Would you allow me just to rely on the Holy Spirit and not my own capabilities? Not my own what I, whatever I think is possible? Maybe this time you just need to say, hey, I'm tired of trusting in me and everybody to trust in Jesus. Whatever it is, we just invite you to respond. Maybe that's through prayer. Maybe you want to sing the song along with us. Maybe you'd like for me to pray for you. I'll be in the back. I'd love to pray for you. Whatever it is, we invite you to respond. Let's pray.